I am pretty sure this is the hardest topic in Calculus 1. Yes, we are talking about the epsilon delta definition for proving limits. And the first thing that we have to do is just to calm down. It's not so bad. I am going to show you guys the definition and we'll explain the definition with an actual example, an actual number, and a picture. And I will show you guys how to write a proof for it with the four keyword method. So let's go ahead and get started right here. Here is the definition. If we have the limit as x approaching some number a, and let's say we have a function f of x, and let's say we do end up with a limit that's called out to be l, well, this right here means that we are going to get the following. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if the absolute value of x minus a is in between of zero and delta, so let me just write that down right here, then we must have the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. So what exactly is this, right? Because, yeah, where is the number? Well, no, zero, but come on. Okay, here is the deal. It's hard to explain this. We will just have to use an example. And the best way is use an example with picture with actual number. That's how I'm going to do it. So for now, don't worry about this. Let's take a look. And perhaps I'll box this right here. All right. So let's look at an example. If we have the limit as x approaching 4, and let's say we have the square root function 2x plus 1. To figure this out, it's not bad at all, right? Because square root of 2x plus 1 is continuous, so we can just put a 4 inside, so we get square root of 2 times 4, and then plus 1, worked out, we get 3. Done deal, right? Yeah, but now this is the time that all the mathematicians will say, how do we know that this is indeed equal to 3? Where's the proof? <laughs> so, this is the time that we are going to use the epsilon delta definition to prove this right here. And based on what we saw earlier, when we have this right here, this means we are going to get the following. So let me write that down. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists another number called delta that's greater than zero, such that, and the word such that just means that the following statement is going to choose. So we will have the following condition, we will have the following property. Such that what? Well, in this case, the a is equal to 4. So let me just put a 4 inside here. So we will have 0 less than and the absolute value, and then x minus 4, and then we have to have this less than delta. If this inequality holds, then we will get the inequality that our function, which is that, so I'll just put down square root of 2x plus 1, and then minus the limit that we got earlier, which is 3, this right here has to be less than delta. So here is the quick explanation. The idea is that if x is not too far away from 4, how far is too far? Well, the distance between x and 4, it has to be less than delta. And delta is supposed to be a small number. If x is really close to 4, then the corresponding value of the function, it must be really close to our limit. And how close is close? Epsilon distance close. So that's pretty much the idea. So this shows that you can get to 3. You can approach 3 as close as possible. Now, let me give you guys a picture for this right here. And we see that the starting is at negative 1 half, and then here is our square root function. And let's say 4 is right here, and we go up, and we see that we have 3 right here. Perfect. Now, I'm going to break this down for you guys. You see that we have for all epsilon greater than 0. What's epsilon? Epsilon is the distance between the function and the limit. All right? And to make this more clear, I'm going to work with an actual value for epsilon. And because epsilon can be any positive number, I'm just going to say, I want to use epsilon to be 0 0.2. Can we choose 0 0.1? Yes. Can we choose 0 0.17? Yes. Up to you. Okay. Once we have this value, we have 3 right here. Again, it's the y value distance, right? So that means we can go up by 0 0.2. I'm just going to put it down right here. So that will give us 3.2. 
But don't forget, we can also go down by 0 0.2, so that will give us 2.8. Cool. And once we have the epsilon value, you can just see that we can create a region like this. And you see that because epsilon can be any positive number, I put down 0 0.2 right here, but imagine if you have 0 0.001, you can kind of narrow it down. And you see that the value of the functions will approach to 3. Perfect, huh? And here's the thing. Based on the limit, you really don't have to have a closed circle here. If when x is 4 and you happen to have an open circle here, even though the value of the function is right here, guess what? When you close it, right, when you get closer and closer to 3, the value of the function is close to 3, the limit is still equal to 3. You really don't need to have the value be exactly as 3 because we have this part of the inequality. x does not have to be equal to a, x does not have to be equal to 4. Now, here's the question. Once we have the epsilon, this is the inequality that we have. What do we do next? Well, you see that for all epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0. What is the delta then? Huh? If you look at this inequality, you see that we have the absolute value of x minus 4 is less than delta, so that's the distance between the x and 4. Yeah, so how do we do it? Well, we have the y values right here already. We just have to kind of trace back down like this. So I'll just put it down like this. And then, of course, I'll put it down like that. Cool. Now, we actually just have to solve some equations. Once we have epsilon greater, once we have epsilon is equal to 0 0.2, the question is, delta is equal to what? Well, this is our function, which is y equals square root of 2x plus 1. We know the y values. We can just go ahead and put 3.2 for the y and solve for x so that we can figure this out. So let's go ahead and do that. And of course, just solve this equation, square both sides, minus 1 divided by 2. And I'll tell you, x will give us 4.62. Yes, I have the answer over there, uh, transparency. So this x value is 4.62. And of course, let's do a similar thing right here. This is when y is equal to 2.8. Put it there. Solve the equation. We get x is equal to 3.42. So of course, I will come here and write down 3.42. I know the picture is horribly wrong, but I just have to do this so that we can all see the picture, of course. All right. Now we have the x values. So we can talk about the distance. x minus 4 has to be inside of the delta neighborhood technical term, okay? So how big is the delta? Well, let's see, from here to here, let's just compute the distance. So we can do this minus that, which is going to be 0 0.62. And then from here to here, we can do 4 minus that, which will get 0 0.58. Great. Now you see, when epsilon is equal to 0 0.2, we have this and that. So which number do we choose to be delta though? Let me tell you a secret. Pick the smaller one that you have. Pick the smaller one that you have. So the answer is going to be 0 0.58. Yeah. Why? Again, what this means is that if x is inside of the delta neighborhood, right, delta region right here. When you go up, you can see that your y value is going to be inside of the epsilon neighborhood, the epsilon region. If you pick 0 0.61, for example, 0 0.61 is right here. Okay, you go up, you can see that the value of the function is inside of this part. That's good, but if you go from 4 and then you move to the left by 0 0.61, you are a little bit outside. When you go up, you see that this point, it's outside of the epsilon region. So pick the smaller one. Yeah. Here is the truth. If you have a question with the actual epsilon value, most likely, you can say delta is equal to 0 0.0000000001 and most likely it's going to work. 
Why? Because if you say delta is this number, that means you are only allowing yourself to move out away from 4 by just a tiny bit like that. Yeah, just a tiny bit. If you are inside here, if you go up, of course, you will be really close to 3. Of course, you will be inside of the Epsilon neighborhood. But if you do this, your teacher will get really mad at you. Usually, the direction is going to say, find the biggest delta that will make this statement true. So hopefully, this right here gives you the idea. And now, as I promised it, I will show you guys how to write a proof for this limit with the Epsilon delta definition. And the key is, know these four words. But first off, though, write down PF for proof. Here we go. First word, you see that right here? Huh? The upside down A is the for all. What you do is, you write given. Yeah. Always. If you don't have this, let me tell you it's wrong. Right? When you are writing the epsilon delta definition proof, always write down given epsilon greater than zero. All right? Next, you see that we have the there exists. And earlier, you see that we have to do the work to find it. And then, hmm, sometimes you may have to choose it, right? So the next word is choose. Choose delta to be, um, to be what though? Well, unfortunately, I don't know yet. Because you see that epsilon here is just arbitrary. And uh, I cannot do any computation yet, right? So don't worry, just leave it, right? Just leave it, just wait, leave it. Next, what do we have next? Such that, just such that doesn't really matter, but you see that we want to have this condition to be useful, so we are going to suppose that this condition to be true, so I'm just going to put down suppose. So given, choose, suppose, this is the third word, suppose this right here is true. So we will have the absolute value of x minus 4, meaning that x is in between of delta, and of course x does not have to be equal to 4, so we put that down. So that's pretty much what we were saying earlier. X has to be uh, in this region here, yeah, on this interval. So, and then later on, when you go up, you want to make sure uh, the value of the function is in this interval. But anyway, third word, suppose. Next, we want this right here to be true. We want, so we have to check it that it's actually true. So the last word is check. Given, choose, suppose, check, and let's go ahead and write that down. We have the absolute value, and we have the square root of 2x plus 1, and then minus 3. And do not just write down less than epsilon, because we haven't <laughs> done anything right here, all right? This is the part that requires some computations and some logical reasoning. So check this out. Here we have a square root case. So what we are going to do is, multiply by the conjugate and also divided by the conjugate. So I'm going to write this down right here. I'm going to put down a bigger absolute value and uh, I will write this down again, square root of 2x plus 1 and then minus 3 and then I will multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate which is square root of 2x plus 1 and then change the minus to a plus and then we still have the 3. So that's the conjugate and then of course do the same thing on the bottom. Oh, plus 3. Perfect. Now, on the top, multiply this out, square root cancel, so we just have 2x plus 1, and then minus, let me just put this on red, 3 times 2, which is 9, so I'll just put on minus 9, like that. Alright, so on the top, we see that it's 2x minus 8, we can factor out the 2, so just do the algebra, and that will be equal to factor out the 2, and then the x minus 4 will still be itself the absolute value. And you see, I just put the absolute value on the top, and that's the property of the absolute value. Next, we'll just put the absolute value on the bottom. But notice, the output of the square root is always positive, and when we ask you to it, it's always positive. So for the bottom here, the absolute value doesn't matter. I'll just write down square root of 2x plus 1, and then of course we still have the plus 3. So what's next then? Well. Hmm. Here's the key. When we are writing proofs, we must use our assumptions, which is this right here. If we don't use the assumption, you know, something's wrong. It all seems wrong, actually. Here we have x minus 4 in the absolute value is less than delta, so you can actually replace this with less than delta. That's good. 
But before we can do that, you see that we have the bottom here. Ah, uh, man, it's trouble. Want to play with some inequality thing? Check this out. Here's the deal. This is always greater than zero, and then we add three to it, so the bottom is always greater than three. Let me tell you, we can actually just ignore the bottom, and then we can just say this is always going to be less than just the numerator, namely two times the absolute value of x minus four. Why can we do that? Well, again, let me give you an example. Let's say we have 10 and 10. Of course, they're equal. But right here, if I divide this by three, which number is bigger? Of course, this is bigger, right? So you see, I just ignore the bottom, right? If you compare this and that, this is going to be less than just the top because square root of 2x plus 1 plus 3. Do not mention it's greater than 0. You actually have to mention that this is greater than 1. Of course, you can also say it's greater than 3. That will also work. But the key is you have to make sure that the bottom is greater than 1. Because if you have 10 and 10, if you divide it by 0 0.1, in fact, this right here will be bigger. This part is exactly our assumption, so we can say this right here is less than, right? This is less than the delta that we have right here, and then we have the two in front, like that. Cool. Now, remember, in the very end, we want to end up with just an epsilon. So I really want to just end up with an epsilon right here. Now, pop quiz for you guys. Two times what will give us epsilon? Epsilon over 2 is the answer, right? So you see, we can just put on a 2 and suppose we choose delta to be epsilon over 2. Aha! 2 and 2 cancel out nicely. So that means we just have to go here and choose delta to be epsilon over 2. And you see, delta is equal to epsilon over 2. And if you read the whole thing now, given epsilon greater than 0, that's this part, we found a delta, that's epsilon over 2. And notice, because epsilon is greater than 0, epsilon over 2 is of course still greater than 0. And if we have this condition, right, then we see that the absolute value of this is less than, yeah, is less than epsilon. So that means we are done. So of course, in the end, we can just put on a box and shade it in because this is a very nice proof. What do you guys think? Cool, huh? Now, before we go, I really want to talk about this right here. You see how earlier, when we have an actual epsilon, like 0.2, we can just do the computation, and we have found that the delta in this case was 0.58. Cool, right? Mm, you see right here, we only have a formula for the delta, and the delta is epsilon over 2. Keep this in mind, when you are doing the proof, most likely you will just end up with a formula in terms of epsilon right here for the delta. And let's see if epsilon was 0.2 right here, okay, will the delta work? If epsilon is equal to 0.2 like what we got earlier, delta based on this formula is going to be 0.2 divided by 2 which is 0.1. Hmm. Earlier, we found the delta was 0.58, and right here, if we use this formula, we get 0.1. Is there anything wrong? No, don't worry about it. Right here, it's just because we are doing the proof. As I said earlier, when you have a specific epsilon value, like 0.2, you can just put out delta to be 0.0000001. That will work, right, most likely, but you are just going to make people mad. Don't do that. As long as this delta is less than this, then you know this is going to work. Check out my other videos if you need help with writing the proofs. Hopefully this helped. That's it.